والذين and those people who يبيتون لربهم who spend their nights for who لربهم for their Lord how سجدا وقياما prostrating and standing يبيتون from بات يبيت با يات what does that mean to spend the night doing something like for example a person spends the night sleeping or spends the night talking or spends the night worshiping so how do they spend their nights لربهم for the sake of their Lord they are سجدا وقياما سجدا plural of ساجد and قياما plural of قائم meaning they spend a part of their night worshiping Allah praying prostrating and standing in prayer now only the person who adopts the first two qualities meaning he walks in an appropriate manner which reflects his personality and when he deals with others he does not waste his energies with them because if you argue with someone who's arguing with you you're wasting your energy right it's not going to get you anywhere think about any time that you had an argument with someone and you really argued with them did they listen to you at the end did you win no what happened you spent so much time perhaps days thinking about it discussing it with other people and it caused you so much mental stress didn't it it took so much of your time so a person who stays away from useless things from useless conversations only such a person can have the energy to worship at night if you spent the day arguing if you spent the day debating if you spent the day walking aimlessly here and there and now you're exhausted will you be able to stand up at night it's not possible so only a person who uses his skills and energies properly he will be able to worship allah in the night as well we see that the sahaba radiyallahu anhu once they went for an expedition and a spy from the enemy came in to see to observe the activities of the muslims so he observed them during the day he observed them during the night and when he went back to his people the people asked him that how did you find these muslims so he said fursanun bin nahari wa ruhbanun bil layli that these people they are fursanun bin nahar they are nights by day and they are ruhbanun bil layli and they are monks by night meaning by day they're like knights meaning they have a lot of energy they're very forceful in battle and during the night it's as though they're monks that they worship so much why were the sahaba able to do that because they stayed away from useless things they focused their energies they channeled all their energies on useful things now over here we see that the worship of the night is mentioned in particular yabituna li rabbih The worship of the night time is mentioned in particular. Now, every believer has to worship during the day. It's an obligation. Like for example, you have to fast during the day. Or for example, you pray five times a day. Right? That's an obligation. But the worship of the night is mentioned in particular. Why? Because it is voluntary. And not just that it's voluntary, but when a person worships at night, then that worship is free from riya. If during the day, You just go into your bedroom, you close the door, and you spend three hours reciting the Qur'an, praying nawafil. People of the house are going to wonder, what are you doing? And you might feel that, oh, I'm reading the Qur'an, they should listen to me, and they should also be reminded that they should also do the same. But if you do the same thing at night, other people will have no idea, because they're busy sleeping. So, the worship that is performed at night time, it is free from riya. And it also helps a person have more khushur. Why? Because you're not distracted by other things. Nobody's watching you. If during the day you're making dua and you're crying, somebody will come and ask you, are you okay? Are you okay? Now what do you tell them? I'm seeking forgiveness? Why? What did you do? So if you worship during the day, what happens? You cannot have khushur. It's very, very difficult. And it's not that people should not ask. I mean, it's very nice of them. They're so concerned about you. So don't feel offended if people ask you. They're only being concerned. But if a person worships during the night, then what will happen? It will help him have more khushur during the night. And when a person worships during the night, then it's just him and his Lord. 
it gives him a sense of qurba, a sense of closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why in the hadith, what do we learn? That one of the seven people under the shade of Allah will be وَرَجُلٌ ذَكَرَ اللَّهَ خَالِيًا فَفَاضَدْ عَيْنَاهُمْ That a person who remembers Allah in seclusion and his eyes, they overflow with tears. Now during the day, if you want to do that, if you're crying, you're alone, all of a sudden your child walks in and wonders, why are you crying? And he starts crying. Or other people get worried. So during the night, it helps to have more khushu. In Surah Al-Dhariyat, Ayah 17 to 18, we learn, كَانُوا قَلِيلًا مِنَ اللَّيْلِ مَا يَهْجَعُونَ وَبِالْأَسْحَارِ هُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ That the people of Jannah, they used to sleep but little of the night. And in the hours before dawn, they would ask forgiveness. Ask forgiveness when? وَبِالْأَسْحَارِ At the hours before dawn. Now apparently it seems very difficult to get up during the night, to pray, to seek forgiveness, to do istighfar, to do sujood, to do qiyam. It seems very difficult. It is challenging. However, if you use your energies properly, if you use your time properly, then Allah will give you tawfiq. Because during the day what happens? We're distracted by so many things. We're wasting our time, wasting our energies on useless things. So if we stay focused, then it will help us get up during the night as well. If a person has patience during the day to deal with the ignorant people, only then he will have the patience to stand up during the night. Because it requires patience. It requires resilience. It requires motivation. It requires a lot of inner strength. So if you have inner strength to deal with the ignorance of people, then you will have inner strength to fight against yourself as well during the night. وَالَّذِينَ And those people who يَقُولُونَ They say, رَبَّنَا O our Lord, إِصْرِفْ عَنَّا عَذَابَ جَهَنَّمْ Turn away from us the punishment of hellfire. إِنَّ عَذَابَهَا كَانَ غَرَامًا Indeed its punishment is ever adhering. What do they pray for? What are their du'as? You see, the du'a of a person, what does it reflect? What does it reflect? Who he is, what he wants, what his goal is, what his worries are, what his concerns are. Like for example, if a person is always making du'a for money, that, Ya Allah, give me more money, give me more risk, what does it show? That he likes money, right? If a person is making du'a for more knowledge, what does it show? He wants more knowledge. If a person prays for righteous company, it shows that he looks forward to righteous company. That's what he likes. So the dua of a person reflect who he really is, what he wants, what he wants to achieve, what he fears, what his concerns are. So what are their concerns? What do they pray for? That, Oh Allah, Ya Rabb, Yaquluna Rabbana, Israf anna adaba jahannam. Turn away the punishment of hellfire from us. Turn it away from us. Think about it. You ask for something to be turned away from you when it's before you. If something is not even before you, how can you ask that it should be turned away from you? What does it show? That they realize their mistakes. They see their shortcomings. And they are certain about the hereafter. And they're concerned, they're worried that what if, what if I end up there? Many times what happens? If a person begins to pray during the night, he is very patient in his manners with other people. What does he think? Jannah is for me. But a true servant of Allah, with all the good that he does, he knows that whatever he is doing is not enough. He knows that at the same time, there are many, many things that are wrong, that he needs to fix, that he needs to improve. Many things, many aspects in which he is lacking. So when a person feels like this, when he realizes his sins, then he sees the punishment right before him. He gets worried, he gets concerned, he gets fearful. And this is why he prays, رَبَّنَا صْرِفْ عَنَّا عَذَابِ جَهَنَّمْ It's as though I'm standing right before it. It's as though the only thing between me and hellfire is death. This is how he feels. He's constantly worried, constantly concerned. This is why he prays to Allah for refuge from the hellfire. Inna adabaha kana gharama. Indeed, the punishment of hellfire is ever adhering. Gharam is from the root letters ghain ramim. And ghurm is used for a fine, a tax. And gharim 
is someone who gives a loan to the other. Now, a person who gives a loan to the other, what does he do? Does he leave the debtor? Does he leave him? No, he keeps a check on him. And he persists, he keeps on asking for his money. Give it back to me. You have one month left, you have two days left. You have to give this back to me. Otherwise, this and this penalty you'll have to pay. So, gharam is that which is inseparable. Inseparable. Ever adhering. That you can never be away from. So, inna adabaha kana gharama. The punishment of hellfire, once a person enters there, then this punishment, this pain, it's going to be permanent. And gharam is also used for difficulty and destruction. It's also used for adabun da'im, eternal punishment. So they fear the punishment of hellfire. Their greatest worry is the fire of hell. This is why they pray, Ya Allah, turn this punishment away from us. Innaha sa'at mustaqallan wa muqama. Indeed, it is evil as a settlement and as a residence. Mustaqar. What is mustaqar? Mustaqar is a place of qarar. And muqam is a place of qiyam. So mustaqar is where a person stays temporarily and muqam is where a person stays permanently. So hellfire is evil as a temporary place of stay and also as a permanent place of stay. It's an evil abode. It's an evil residence. It's an evil settlement. What do we see over here? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls these people Ibad rahman and at the same time, they have fear of the punishment of Allah. Is it because they're bad people? Is it because they're very sinful? What's the reason then? Why are they afraid? They know that whatever they have done is not enough. They see their shortcomings. This is just as we learned early in Surah Al-Mu'minun, Ayah 60, that وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْتُونَ مَا آتَى وَقُلُوبُهُمْ وَجِلَ أَنَّهُمْ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ رَاجِعُونَ that those who give whatever they give, they do whatever they do, but at the same time their hearts are wajila, fearful. Because they know that one day they'll return to Allah. And if you notice that hell is a place that is very evil as a temporary and as a permanent place of stay. Many times what happens? People say, that doesn't matter if I do this, if I commit these sins, if I commit these mistakes, no big deal. Eventually I will go to Jannah. Because I've said, La ilaha illallah. But what do we see? That if a person is in hellfire, even for a few moments, even for a few moments, it's a terrible place to be in. Sa'at mustaqarran wa muqama. And those for whom there is eternity in hellfire, no matter how much they strive to come out of hellfire, they'll never be out. In Surah Al-Ma'idah, Ayah 37, we learn, يُرِيدُونَ أَن يَخْرُجُوا مِنَ النَّارِ وَمَا هُمْ بِخَارِجِينَ مِنْهَا وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ مُقِيمٌ They will wish to get out of the fire, but never will they emerge from there. And for them is enduring punishment. In Surah Baqarah 162 we learn, خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا لَا يُخَفَّفُ عَنْهُمُ الْعَذَابُ وَلَا هُمْ يُنظَرُونَ Abiding eternally therein, the punishment will not be lightened for them, nor will they be reprieved. In Surah An-Nisa 56 we have learned, كُلَّمَا نَضِجَتْ جُلُودُهُمْ بَدَّلْنَاهُمْ جُلُودًا غَيْرَهَا لِيَذُوقُ الْعَذَابِ Every time their skins are burnt out, they'll be replaced with a new set of skins. So they realize that this is what hellfire is. This is why they're afraid. They're ibadul rahman They show servitude to Allah. They are humble. They are obedient. They are worshippers. But at the same time, they are afraid. And this is what true ibadah is. That a person stays between fear and hope. A person stays between fear and hope. That he hopes for mercy, he hopes for reward, but at the same time he fears punishment. Because when a person stays between fear and hope, then what happens? Think about it, what happens? He will do more. He will keep doing. He will increase in his good deeds. And if a person thinks, what I've done is enough. I've done this, I've done that, I do this already, I do that already. That will not motivate him to do more. So this fear, it drives them to be conscious, to be careful, to be obedient in every aspect of life, even in their finances. That وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا أَنْفَقُوا That those people, when they spend for anything, when they spend on themselves, when they spend on their families, how do they spend? لَمْ يُسْرِفُوا 
they do not spend excessively. But at the same time, وَلَمْ يَقْتُرُوا Nor do they spend sparingly. وَكَانَ بَيْنَ ذَلِكَ قَوَامًا But are ever between that justly moderate. What does it mean by israf? لَمْ يُسْرِفُوا What does israf mean? That a person overspends. What does it mean by that? That a person spends beyond the needs, more than the need, more than what is necessary. Now, does not mean a person cannot have anything extra? Like for example, you can live on five pairs of clothes. Can you not have six? Can you not have seven? Would that be israf? Israf is that when a person cannot afford much, but still, what does he do? He spends beyond the permissible limit. Or he spends beyond what he can afford. Just recently, somebody was telling me that somebody who used to work for them back home, they came to them once and they said that, you know, I just got my son married. Can you please give me this much money? We didn't realize we had a lot of expenses. And the kind of money they spent was beyond what they could afford. Why? Because they had to give gifts to everybody and they had to give so much money to the girl and so much money to the boy and this and that and all the feasts and the dresses and everything. This is what? Israf. That when people have to work for two to three years to make sure they have enough money so that they can throw a huge wedding party, a huge wedding feast. Or they are not allowed to get married. Why? Because their parents say to them, you do not have enough money, we do not have enough money to throw a huge party. If it's not within your ability, then you don't need to take a loan. You don't need to sacrifice on your education. Many times it happens that girls, for example, they will not be sent to school, or if they have to go to school, they have to take a loan, and all the money that the parents have, what will that go on? On their gold jewelry? On their wedding dresses? On all those 50-some clothes that have to be stitched when they get married? The same money could be spent on their education so they do not have to take a haram loan. You know, I'm amazed sometimes. People come, they're confused. What do we do? Should we take this loan or not? But at the same time, when you go to their wedding, when you go to their brother's wedding, to their sister's wedding, it's as though they're millionaires. They cannot afford education, but they can afford such expensive wedding party. This is what israf is. That a person spends beyond the limits. And... Israf also includes that a person spends for the sake of showing off. Think about it. What's the objective of getting all that gold jewelry, all those clothes at the time of wedding, and all that decoration? What's the objective? Yes, it should look nice. Understood. It should look nice. It's a wedding. You should have a happy feeling. The place should look nice. The people should look nice. Understandable. However, things can look nice even within a certain limit. Why is it that everything has to be color coordinated and everything has to be matched and everything has to be on special order? Why is it like that? What's the objective? It's to impress the people. So israf also includes spending for the sake of showing off. And it's not just spending for the sake of showing off, but israf also includes spending on prohibited matters. Sufyan al thawri he said that ahabba, even a grain that is spent in disobedience to Allah, what is it? It's israf. It's extravagance. So even if a person spends a little bit on haram, then that is what? Israf. So, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا أَنْفَقُوا لَمْ يُسْرِفُوا Whenever they spend, they make sure that they're not spending on haram. They make sure they're not spending beyond their limit. They make sure that they're not spending just to show off for self-projection. Because in all of these three ways, wealth is being wasted. If you spend on haram, if you spend to show off, if you spend beyond your limit, in reality, what are you doing? Wasting the money. Because whatever you bought to show off to the people, all that color coordination and perfect things at the wedding, perfect decoration, what's going to happen to all of that the next day? Where is it going to go? Garbage. All that lovely material that was ordered, so much time was spent to choose the particular color and the fabric and the decoration. All of that, it's going to go into the garbage the next day. You're not going to wear it. So the first thing is, Lam Yusrifu. This is one extreme. What's the other extreme? That a person becomes very stingy, very tight-fisted. 
Like for example, when it comes to a wedding, he says, what's the need of a wedding dress? Just wear simple clothes. And honestly, when it comes to wedding dresses even, there should be such clothes that a person can actually wear afterwards. Either at their sister's wedding or their cousin's wedding or something. At least they should be wearable again. Because if a person gets something made or they wear something just to impress other people at that moment, at that time, and they can never ever wear that again, then that suit, that dress is going to sit for years and years and years. It's a total waste. And think about how expensive these dresses. Literally someone's house could be renovated. Somebody could get education for that money. Somebody could go for hajj. You know, that how many times it happens that people, they don't go for umrah, they don't go for hajj for years and years. What's the reason? We don't have money. But they have money to buy expensive shoes and expensive clothes and expensive bags and expensive this and that, one thing after the other. It's about having the right priorities, right? So, لَمْ يُسْرِفُوا وَلَمْ يَقْتُرُوا يَقْتُرُوا is from the root letters قَافْ And iqta is when someone spends very little on permissible matters as well. When someone spends very little on permissible matters. Like for example, you're going for groceries, you're buying food, you're buying fruit, fresh, healthy, good fruit you're buying for your family. But you say, what's the point of getting one apple per person? Let me just get two, everybody will share. You have the money, you can afford. There's no need to be stingy. It's a permissible matter. It's something that you should be spending on. So don't go stingy over there. Be careful with your phone so that you have less phone bills. Be careful with your all these cable channels that you have for which you have to pay every month. Because many times people will spend on TV, they will spend on you know, internet, on phone, on so many things. And it's possible that these things are very important, but at the same time they will compromise on things that are necessary. When it comes to paying for a class, when it comes to buying a good book, when it comes to hiring someone to do some work for you so that you have time to pray, you have time to save for something, we will not save over there. And aqtara is to spend very little. And muqtir is of a very stingy nature. Someone who is very tight in his nature, he is very stingy. And in particular, it is also used for someone who is very stingy with his family. When it comes to spending on himself, no problem. When it comes to spending on the friends, no problem. But when it comes to spending on the wife, on the kids, then it's a problem. So, lam yaqturu, they're not stingy. Then how do they spend? وَكَانَ بَيْنَ ذَلِكَ قَوَامًا And their matter is ever between that. Between what? Between israf and iqtar. Their matter is of qawam. What does qawam mean? Qawam is from qaf wa mean. And qawam is to be of upright posture. When something is upright, it's balanced from both sides. Neither bending to the right nor to the left. Straight, upright posture. So وَكَانَ بَيْنَ ذَلِكَ قَوَامًا They have a moderate way of spending between iqtar and israf. And how is that? That they spend according to the commands that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given. They spend where it is necessary to spend. So what does it show? That Ibad rahman they're also very sensible when it comes to money matters. Many times we think that if a person is righteous, he shouldn't be concerned about money. We think that you should have an open hand and you should spend lavishly. You know, Allah gives risk, so why worry? Sometimes people go to this extreme. And without keeping any account, they will spend, 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 spend. Without realizing that they're spending beyond the need, beyond what they can afford. So Ibad rahman they are very sensible when it comes to money, when it comes to spending. They spend where it is necessary to spend. And they spend according to their pocket. They are not extravagant. They don't spend more than the need. And they are not even stingy when it comes to spending on good things. Like for example, it's possible that a person spends a lot on himself, on his family, but he does not spend on the deen. Even this is inappropriate. وَكَانَ بَيْنَ ذَلِكَ قَوَامًا What does it mean? That a person spends everywhere, wherever it is necessary. How much ever is necessary. So this moderation is extremely important. In Surah Al-Isra, Ayah 27, we learn, إِنَّ الْمُبَذِّرِينَ كَانُوا إِخْوَانَ الشَّيَاطِينَ That indeed the wasteful, who are they? The brothers of shayateen. 
In Surah Al-Isra, Ayah 29, we learn, وَلَا تَجْعَلْ يَدَكَ مَغْلُولَةً إِلَىٰ عُنُقِكَ وَلَا تَبْسُطْهَا كُلَّ الْبَسْطِ فَتَقْعُدَ وَلُومُ مَحْسُورًا Meaning, don't go to extremes. Don't tie up your hand completely and don't open it up completely. Rather, be moderate. Because if you go to any extreme, then you will become remorseful, regretful at the end. So we see that money matters, they have a lot to do with what? Understanding. Because every purchase that you make, don't you have to decide before it? Many times what happens? You see an advertisement. You see, oh my God, this looks very nice. You don't see about whether you need it or not. You go to the mall, you see it, you buy it. Or for example, just because something is on sale, people have to go through all those aisles and find something that they can make use of. Just because it is on sale. And what if I need it later? You see, we should just make one principle. Buy only what you need. Buy only what you need. And you will see that you will have the money to buy what you need if you spend only on what you need. Sometimes we spend on things just because we like them, just because we want them. And what if we need them? And what if this happens? And what if that happens? Keep what if for later. When it happens, then deal with it. Okay, we listen to the recitation.